Well, hello, Strings fans. Uh, my name is Jamie Lamar. I'm the concert commentator for a long time at Strings. And I'm so happy right now to be joining you with our wonderful pianist from this evening's concert, which hasn't taken place yet because I'm actually interviewing you a few days before. But this is Denai Durkin, and she's the wonderful pianist that joined us in this virtual uh, concert that we experienced tonight. Denai, welcome. It's wonderful to meet you. Thank you. Very nice to meet you. So tell me a little bit about this experience of performing a concert in a place and then having it virtually presented somewhere else. Have you done, how, how long have you been doing this and what's the experience like as, a, as an artist, as a performer? Well, I haven't been doing it for a very long time. This is actually my second augmented reality concert. And it is a very different experience from the usual concert hall experience because I find that one really adapts to the concert hall, one feels the audience, the atmosphere. And in this case, one really has to imagine all of that. So when I was recording this program, I really um, had to really try very often to start again and get, me, get myself into that mental space of concert mode on stage. And I think that's what really is the challenge here because it is kind of nerve wracking to just play for a camera and a microphone, but you want to find that special feeling where you know this is the level in which you connect with the audience and to find that while you're alone in your room is, I think, what, what makes it uh, very difficult. Right, because how do you prepare for that, right? I mean, as, as musicians, you spend hundreds of thousands of hours in a room by yourself practicing but it's a completely different thing when you actually are performing, right? You don't, you can't practice exactly the same way you perform because when you're performing, there's sort of anything could happen and you can react and adapt to what's happening in the room. Absolutely. You can kind of practice all the scenarios that you can imagine could happen, but you never can really 100% reenact what's going to happen on stage and how you're going to feel on stage. That's what makes it special. And in a way, this video recording is, of course, a little bit of a stage feeling because, you know, it's this one time and it has to be perfect in, in one take. So um, it, it kind of is comparable to the dream gets on stage. Right. Interesting. Well, tell me a little bit about the program. Um, now, I haven't seen the performance yet. I haven't seen the virtual augmented reality performance yet. And perhaps you talk about the program a little bit during the body of the concert. But I was particularly struck by the, the title of your concert is East Meets West, right? East and West. And I, I recognize and that West, yeah. there are composers represented from a lot of different nationalities on the program. Is that sort of one of the components that you were talking about in the title? Exactly. It's kind of divided into two halves, the eastern half and the western half. Mm -hmm. And it is east and west in kind of a broad sense. So east also includes, from the European perspective, also Chopin from Poland. And it includes um, also pieces like, uh, for, like Greek music from Kalomiris. Um, which, because I'm half Greek, is something that is pretty close to my heart. And then Western music um, includes also Greek, for example, of course, German, um, Austrian, Schubert, and, and these kind of composers, and also a Spanish composer, Manuel de Falla. And what I tried to do with this program was to use musical works that all are kind of influenced by folk tunes. So all of these pieces somehow are inspired by folk rhythms, um, folk music, somehow composers traveling through the countries like Schubert's Lendla, for example, which kind of depict these Austrian melodies. Um, and they all capture the essence of each country. And I wanted to put them all in one program to show how when we focus on all these very different cultural accents that come out in the music, um, what remains is not something that makes us think, oh my God, we're all so different and therefore so far apart, but rather so different and therefore can be so connected. So that really mm -hmm. the diversity goes together. Excellent. I, I think the composer that most people would be least familiar with on the program is Calamiris, who is the representative Greek composer that you mentioned. Yes. And you, you said that you're half Greek. What um, had you, um, known his music very long. What's your connection with him particularly? 
Um, actually, I started kind of getting into his music and discovered it only a couple of years ago. I didn't really know him before that, and it was a huge discovery for me because he wrote a lot for piano and um, for Greek classical music, he's kind of the founding father of all of that. He really strict classical music as we know it from the Greek composers. And um, his music is so striking because it has all of these influences of kind of Greek, um, also a little bit Anatolian melodies mm. and rhythms. So one can really hear the country that he's from. But at the same time, it's very uh, technically and musically demanding music. And um, I, I really uh, loved it when I first heard it and studied a lot of his pieces. And these five preludes and, and the nocturne that I'm playing on the program, um, I liked so much that I also recorded them on, on a CD. So these are two pieces that I've been working on for a very long time. Excellent. Well, I did listen to some of those recordings and they're, they're really imaginative and colorful very beautiful works and I love the way, now that I've heard your interpretation, I can't imagine how anyone else would play them, but it's so beautifully <laughs> performed. I think that's gonna be one of the Thank most you. memorable parts of your, of your performance. I also am a great fan of Bela Bartok's Romanian dances. And I think, again, um, this was, they were originally written um, not for the piano, right? So is this Bartok's arrangement? Yes, uh, it, Bartok did this arrangement himself. So in a way we can say it's an original. Right, very beautiful uh, and, and evocative and very memorable pieces, I think, hummable even, which people don't necessarily always associate that with Bartok, but these are crowd pieces. Absolutely, also very inspired by the, the, the folk music of Romania in that case. Right, talk to me a little bit about the Pulank as well. Uh, he was a keyboard player, organist and a pianist, I believe. And usually it's his piano music in particular, very, very demanding stuff. Yes, the Pulunk is a, the piece that kind of falls out of this whole folk element that I mentioned. The Nocturnes are not really inspired by folk music, but I included them in the program because I find that they really picture this French flair very, very well. I, I find that Pulunk has an incredible sound world and his colors are so recognizable. When you're the first Nocturne already, you immediately feel transported into some kind of French uh, landscape. Um, and, and this is why I thought they were so fitting because they really make you feel that, that you're there. And, and of course, they're incredibly beautiful pieces. Uh, now, I'm not going in any particular order. Let's talk about the first piece on your program, which is the Chopin Polonaise, a very well-known work. And of course, every pianist sort of has um, maybe not an obligation, but every pianist wants to perform Chopin. What's the difficulty in, play, in interpreting Chopin? I feel like um, Chopin on the one hand is technically very demanding, but the real difficulty is not to manage to play it, but while managing to, 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 to really master that technical side, to have that that ease because his mu music is very light. It's never supposed to sound heavy. And um, yeah, one doesn't imagine a, a big fat bronze sitting there, <laughs> but it's light, airy. And I think that's the real difficulty to keep it so transparent um, while playing this very difficult stuff that he writes. Right. And of course he was writing on a, on a, a piano that is not necessarily very much like a big Steinway, you know? Exactly, the keys were much lighter, they were smaller. So playing an octave was different than playing an octave today, for example. And also you could play much faster because the keys were so much lighter. So um, yeah, it's, it's interesting when we have to transfer that to the Steinway D of, of today's times, um, but, but, but it is definitely possible. I mean, it's more comparable to the piano that we have today than, for example, a Beethoven or, or Mozart, of course. And, and talk to me a little bit about the Manuel de Falla. I, I'm, I'm not sure I knew of this arrangement uh, before, but it's a, it's a well-known work, um, the, the, the ritual dance, fire dance, um, but it, it's brilliant on the piano and I love, I love the sound of it. Is it as fun to play as it sounds like it is? Yes, it's very fun to play. And the first time I discovered it was when I watched a, a, a recorded recital of Atos 
longer played very well. And this is how I discovered this work for piano. And this again is an arrangement by the composer himself. Um, of course, the original is for orchestra. And I was very intrigued by the piece. I watched the movie because this is the music that accompanies a movie called El Amor Brujo, which means forbidden love. And um, the story of people dancing around the fire in the village and trying to make um, bad spirits go away. And I think that really is depicted in the music. That's wonderful. Now, as I talk to you today, or wh where in the world are you right now? <laughs> Um, I actually right now am in Italy, um, in Naples. I had a concert here and, I'm, and then I'm flying back to Germany tomorrow. Incredible. That's great. Congratulations. That sounds like fun. You know, concerts are such a rarity these days. Um, tell me a little bit more about where, do you happen to know where, what other places your recital that we're, we're going to hear from Steamboat Springs, Colorado, where else will, will people be able to see that? in the world? Um, well, I mean, of course, the recital that will happen now is uh, viewable for everyone in the world. Right. But um, it has already been played at St. Gaudens. Um, this was the first um, reality concert. And then um, for me playing it live, it's planned a couple of times. Um, in Europe, I just played it at the Concert House in Berlin. And um, next, I'm, I'm playing it in Austria, in the Bruckner Haus in Linz. Um, so I've been playing this. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it's a concert. Fantastic. Does it feel, do you, I know we talked a little bit about how you had to sort of project an audience into the room with your imagination when you were recording. But uh, does it, when you know that people, so when the audience that just watched your performance, most of them I imagine will be people that have been in the pavilion at String and they're tuning in because they have a relationship already with Strings Music Festival and they've missed having concerts there. So it's lovely to sit in the comfort of their own home and, and, and immerse themselves in the environment of that room. I, I wonder if there's a, a way that you feel like I mean, you've probably never even been to Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Maybe you have. No, I haven't. <laughs> right. So now there's this amazing experience where people have seen you play in the hall that they know and love, and, and, but you've never even been there. So anyway, I don't know if you have any thoughts or how strange that must be yeah. as an artist. Exactly. I mean, on the one hand, it's, of course, very strange. But on the other hand, it's so special that somehow there is this way to connect artists to audiences, and in this case, even to an audience that I don't actually even know yet. I hope that I'm going to meet them in person one day. Um, and I think that especially in these times where physical distance is so prevalent and important, that we can connect through music and somehow be close to each other is such a privilege. And that's why I'm really so grateful that I get to do these augmented reality concerts. And also my friends that, and, and fans that are, for example, in Europe, they actually tune in and watch them because it's a way for them also to see because travel restrictions are big here as well. And, and we, we don't get to meet up as we would usually. Right. It's, it's so true. It's it, people really miss uh, the experience of going to live concerts, and I hope, to whatever extent it's safe to do so, that we are able to do it again, as much as possible. Absolutely. Uh, do you have any um, big plans coming up? What are what are some other projects that you're working on? Um, my next big project is Chopin Second Piano Concerto. I'm uh, playing a tour with that uh, in two months. And then I have a premiere on a, a, a Cypriotic composer for, um, uh, it's, a, it's a work for two pianos and I'm playing it with my sister in Cyprus. So we have five concerts, premiere and then repeating it four times there. Um, so these are the two next big things that I'm doing. Um, yeah, and then I, I, I hope they're gonna take place and then let's take it from there and hope that the next season is actually happening. <laughs> right, right. That's fantastic. That sounds sounds lovely to spend spend a few days or weeks in Cyprus anytime. For sure. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's been such a delight to talk to you, uh, Denai Dorkin, uh, our artist from tonight's virtual reality concert, augmented reality concert, I should say, at the Strings Pavilion. Uh, thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you.